Well, hello everyone, and welcome uh, to Tools for the Creative Life. Creative Life, not Luff. Creative Life. I'm John Mikowski, Executive Director of Transforming Creatives, and uh, we're excited to bring you another in our series of monthly workshops. Today's topic is a creative's guide to grants and calls. So if you've been uh, looking for a way to fund your next big project or apply for a fellowship that uh, maybe gives you the support you need to help make uh, your creative vision come true, this is the perfect workshop for you. Uh, so we are, we're so glad you're here. And this, this whole series of workshops comes together through a fantastic partnership. And I'm gonna ask the partners to introduce themselves in, in just a minute. Uh, but before that, uh, we believe that it is critical that we acknowledge the, the land we live on and honor those who have been dishonored on it. So let me read this acknowledgement. We live, work and create on land that is traditionally territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We intentionally recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor elders past, present, and future, and all those who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We recognize that government, academic, and cultural institutions uh, were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous people. We also recognize that much of our nation was built by the hands and on the backs of enslaved Africans and indigenous peoples. We stand in awe of their resilience and creativity and we express gratitude for and celebrate their past and ongoing contributions. We strive to never take for granted the privilege and complexity of living, working and creating on this land and intentionally honor black, indigenous, and communities of color in our city. We commit to cultural equity and strive to make this a safe and welcoming space where healing can occur, truths can be told, hidden stories unearthed, and legacies of oppression and inequity continually dismantled. Also, we uh, are, are dedicated to presenting this event inclusively so we encourage you to update uh, your name to include your pronouns if you desire. And now I would love for you to uh, just meet our incredible partners, beginning with uh, Jennifer Dewey at the Denver Public Library. Hi everybody. Like John said, my name is Jen and I'm with Denver Public Library. Um, here at the library, we believe in creating and nurturing a strong community where everybody thrives. And I believe that by meeting here today with you, we are doing just that. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to let you know that all 26 Denver Public Library locations are doing curbside pickup. Um, we're also, we've got nine locations also open for some limited in-person hours. So you can find that information as well as tons of other virtual programs for all ages and lots of resources you can um, access from home online at denverlibrary.org. So come visit us there. Um, we are thrilled to be working with all of these partners who you're going to be hearing from shortly. Um, it's been almost exactly a year since everyone, everything shut down, which is incredible, um, hard to believe. And I know it's been challenging for everyone and I would argue especially challenging for artists and those working in the arts. So I hope that this series is informative and also inspires you. Um, and I wanted to also thank all of our amazing panelists who are here today. I'm so excited to hear from all of them. Um, and again, thank you, our guests, for choosing to be here with us today. There's tons of stuff happening online. So thank you for choosing um, this program to join. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Meredith from CBCA. Hi, thanks, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Meredith Badler. I'm the Deputy Director at CBCA, which stands for the Colorado Business Committee for the Arts. Uh, I love this partnership. We are so honored um, to be uh, a programming partner with Denver Public Library, the Rhino Arts District, Transforming Creatives, um, and our wonderful panelists today. These are 
truly some of my favorite people in, in the metro area. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Uh, CBCA is uh, focused on advancing and elevating our creative economy in Colorado. Um, we do that specifically through the intersection of arts and business, uh, helping creative professionals, artists, cultural organizations, um, arts businesses to grow and thrive in our state. Um, we believe that art is smart for business um, and that there is a lot that our business sector can learn from the arts and that the arts are an integral part of our economy, our health and well being, um, and really strengthen our communities in Colorado. So um, we are always honored to be part of programs like this that help artists do their work better. Um, uh, and that's that's what we're here to do today. So um, that's us. Please check us out, cbca.org. Um, and I'll turn it over to Allie Sharp with the Rhino Arts District. Hi, everyone. I am Allie Sharp. I am the Outreach Director for the Rhino Art District. I am here today with our Curation Director, Alex Pangburn. And we are also thrilled to be a partner in this series. Um, lots of wonderful topics that we have uh, planned out throughout the next few months and we'll continue this series throughout the year. Um, this is one of our virtual programs. We also are partnering with the Public Library on doing some youth art projects um, throughout the year. We have another one coming up in May. Um, focus on stickers and slaps um, for youth. So definitely check our website out for other programming we have going on there. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Steph with Creative Integration Initiative. Thanks, Ali. Hi, I'm Steph with Creative Integration Initiative. We offer um, creative entrepreneurship coaching workshops like this series and just so thrilled to be collaborating with this group, um, as well as art curation and just, you know, online at um, our website is creativeintegrationinitiative.org and feel free to reach out if you guys have any questions or want to connect, love connecting with the community um, at large. And I'll turn it over to John from Transforming Creatives to introduce Transforming Creatives and kick the day off. Thanks so much. Thanks, Steph. Thanks to all of you so much. Uh, I'd like to introduce the moderator now for today's panel. Um, our mission at Transforming Creatives is to invest in the health of creatives so they can invest in the health of society. And part of our work includes operating a creative workspace uh, right here in the Rhino Art District called Converge Denver that is home to filmmakers and photographers and visual artists and designers and writers and nonprofits and other super creative humans who, who are working together in community to create a more just, equitable, and, and flourishing society. And our moderator today, Leah Podzimek, is our community manager at Converge. But she's also a grant writer she owns her own production company, uh, and she's an accomplished opera singer, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so please join me in welcoming the multi-talented Leah Podzimek. Thanks, John, so much for that introduction. I know I do lots of things, and it's hard for me to wrangle all of them inside my mind because they all kind of fluctuate and meet with each other, which is why I'm so excited to be moderating this panel today, bringing together other people who work with organizations and artists throughout our Denver community and further to get them some funding through grants and open calls and provide those opportunities for them. This event today is really about you and your artwork, whatever that might be, whether you're a painter hoping to apply to a residency, a sculptor looking for a city call to put your work in the public realm or a musician looking for a way to fund your summer program or your next upcoming album. The focus today is about showing you that you can do something like this and that you likely already have the resources you need to write a compelling grant application or a response to a call. We've structured today pretty open-endedly with the intent to provide some general information about how to craft a successful proposal and then create as much space as possible for you to ask any and all questions that you might have. So to get things started, I actually want to ask all of you why you're here today. What's your purpose in attending? Are you 
looking for help for a specific opportunity that you've already identified or do you need resources on how to find and where to find these kinds of opportunities? Overall, what drove you to register today? It'll help us get a sense of where you're at and how we can integrate your needs. If you wouldn't mind popping those questions, have a, a little think about it and pop those into the chat. We'd love to see what your responses are. And with that, I am actually really happy to introduce our panelists as well. They're each going to introduce themselves, what they do, and the opportunities that they help to manage individually. Uh, Brendan, why don't you go first? Hi, everybody. Welcome, and uh, thanks to Leah and, and the co-hosts for having me. Um, my name is Brendan Picker. I'm a program administrator with the City of Denver Public Art Program, uh, which is under the Arts and Venues umbrella. Uh, so I help manage public art projects from budget allocation uh, through art selection and then working with the artists to implement their project in a public space. Uh, so that's mainly what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I've been doing public art for about 10 years now, uh, first with the city of Albuquerque and, and now with city of Denver. Um, I can also touch on a couple of our other grant programs under the arts and venues umbrella. Um, so yeah. Thanks again. Uh, Crystal, would you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Leah, for inviting me. And, and uh, it's wonderful to see everybody today. My name is Crystal Polis. And after working in various arts and history museums <clears throat> uh, for about the last 25 years and, and arts organizations. About a year ago, right before the pandemic, I started my own business um, uh, to do grant writing for small nonprofits and individual artists and, and arts related for profit businesses. Um, I my background is as a curator and, and grant writer and administrator in those organizations. And so I've um, seen what it's like when you have a large budget or a small budget or a medium budget, um, no budget. And I, I kind of felt like I wanted to just take those years of being on that side and go to the other side of, um, and I, I've worked for also places where we've given away grants. Um, and so gotten knowledge from what it's like to read a successful proposal and fund it. So I wanted to just take that knowledge and, and help uh, small businesses uh, so that they could be more successful as well. Yeah, wonderful work. And then um, Louise, introduce yourself, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Louise Martirano, the executive director of Redline Contemporary Arts Center in Five Points. Um, I'm so happy to be here and also thank to all the hosts and Leah for organizing this and uh, including me in the conversation. Um, Redline uh, is a contemporary art center that fosters education and engagement between artists and communities to create positive social change. And we live that, of course, through some of our founding programs like our artists in residence program that provides free studio space and professional development for career oriented artists for two years. Um, I'm very excited to be part of this conversation because I think as many of you who are on this call are artists um, and uh, you are so often asked to do everything and every part of your uh, profession from building resources to uh, implementation to project management to reporting and so my I think goal in life has become to try to make that a little easier because a lot of other professions ha have more infrastructure than mm -hmm. uh, being a creative or an artist and so um, I really am excited to try to provide as many tips and advice as I can about helping that infrastructure and that capacity that you guys are all asked to wake up with every day mm -hmm. and hopefully lessening that burden on you. So again, it's a deep pleasure. Redline is open these days, so feel free to come and see us, um, at, though it's by appointment um, and of course with masks, but we would love to see you. And yeah, thank you again for joining us today. Yay. Thank you so much to the three of you for being here. Um, as everyone might be able to see, we've got kind of like a, a representative group that spans different 
industries within the arts and different perspectives. And that was pretty intentional on our part. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that we're keeping today's workshop wide open. So as we move along, please don't hesitate to use the chat feature and ask questions when you have them. And we'll try and integrate them as we go. We really want this to be more of a discussion among amongst the four of us and involving all of you in this. Uh, depending on how many questions we get, we might have a more formal Q&A towards the end. So stick around if you ask a question and it doesn't get answered. I just wanted to look and share kind of what everyone said in the chat. We're looking for resources about funding an individual artist, um, best practices for applications and grants, meeting fellow change makers, learning about new opportunities, um, public art applications and securing money for projects by a grant, more information in general about the process, about writing pro proposals for local and regional grants. So I think we've got, you know, a pretty good range here of people who are interested in all aspects of this process. So to kick it off, the first question that I want to ask our panelists is, you know, you mentioned what kind of opportunities you manage, but what other kinds of opportunities exist for artists and creatives in the world of grants and calls, all of those kinds of things? Louise, you want to go first? Sure. So, you know, um, one of the roles that I think Redline has jumped into recently that I forgot to point out in the introduction is the regranting work that we do. And part of the reason why we kind of uh, jumped into this work is because the lack of funding opportunities that are directly accessible to artists as individuals. Oftentimes there's an institutional gatekeeper in relationship to grant access. And so, you know, in that the, the entity, whether it's a foundation, isn't able to give direct grants to artists. And so Redline um, has different grant opportunities like the Insight Fund or Arts and Society, all which is on our kind of grants and resources page on our website. Um, but, you know, I do think that there's definitely um, a lot of uh, resources out there regionally for artists and that signing up for listservs for things like callforentry.org or submittable or artwork archive, some of the, um, the Rhino Arts District, you know, getting on these mailings lists that oftentimes will kind of repost obviously Denver Arts and Venues, um, different opportunities that are going on. So I know we all hate our email inboxes and we really hate computers right now, which I am with you. However, I do think it is a really good thing to do to in some ways allocate part of your work week as an artist to jumping on these different websites and just seeing what's rolling up. And, you know, because certainly uh, opportunities and receiving opportunities is somewhat of a cumulative game. And I, I would just add to that, um, the cities, the municipalities. Uh, right now, the city of Westminster has a call for artists for a mural project open. Um, the city of Broomfield, uh, city of Lafayette, city of Boulder, they, you know, um, Fort Collins has a terrific public art program. So I know it's a lot of listservs, but um, that's, those are really good ones. And those are uh, usually very good commissions. Um, also the SCFD has uh, a good mailing list in Colorado Creative Industries. And I think we're going to send out a resource list at the end too with all of these. But um, I, yeah, I, I, I second that to what Louise said. It's, you just have to, you just have to keep reading and, and staying uh, alert of, what, of what's out there. Yeah, I think you've, you've both mentioned the breadth of opportunities that exist, but I think there are two primary buckets, right? There are grants that you can apply for that would fund Kind of whatever you want to do or a specific project that you propose but then there are also calls which are a lot more specific and i think brendan you might have a good perspective on 
how those two types of opportunities differ. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I'll definitely echo Louise and Crystal um, with their list. I mean, municipalities, I mean, the list goes on, but I think um, in terms of public art, our calls are, are really are specific and they're site specific. So um, it's one thing, I mean, it's great if you have a body of work that you're proud of, um, you're working with certain materials, certain themes, um, but when you do look at public art calls, usually there's a specific site, a specific budget, uh, specific themes that the art selection panel has compiled that they want would like you to respond to. Um, so it really is, it's, it's, it's more about um, figuring out if your work is appropriate for the site, um, if you have an interest in the site for some reason, uh, or in the communities around the site. Um, so really kind of looking at your work, looking at the call and seeing if it's a good fit to begin with. Um, also knowing that if you do um, kind of venture into the world of public art, it really is, it's a, it's a, it's a team, you know, you'll, if you get the commission, you're working with the public art staff, you're working with the host agency that's building this larger capital project. Um, you know, it's, it's, you're working with lots of different stakeholders. And so just being aware of that, um, it's a lot different than, like you mentioned, Leah, applying for a grant to support a project that you're already invested in. Um, it's a, it's kind of a different ball game, but hopefully we can, you know, answer questions, you know, more directly about, you know, both of those buckets, like you mentioned. And I, I would say also, um, it is there, it's true that there are not nearly the same number of grant opportunities for individual artists as there are for organizations. Um, in addition to the one as Louise mentioned, uh, Arts and Society um, and Redline, um, I would encourage people to look at Boulder County Arts Alliance if you do live in, in, or work in Boulder County. Um, <clears throat> they're one of the few funders, their, their grants are small, but they do fund individual artists. Um, but so what you can also do is collaborate. If you have an, a good idea and you have an organize, another nonprofit or arts business that has a similar mission, or you, 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 know, you could see yourself being a part of their budget, um, or if you see a, a festival or a project that you would like to be a part of, <clears throat> see if you can find a way to sign on to an event that's already getting its own funding and that you could be a line item for that project. Um, so really like, you know, being part of the team, it's, it, you know, being part of a collaboration that funders love collaborations. Is that there are even more opportunities arising that are focused on collaborative projects, right? Um, one of the organizations I work with is the Playground Ensemble, and they're a new music organization and, and ensemble in Denver. And they have their own pool of funds from their own funder that are geared towards collaborating with other non-musical individuals, creatives, organizations throughout the city. So I think the more that we move through our experiences of the past year and what we've all learned as a result, that more of these opportunities for collaborative projects are going to keep arising. So collaboration is kind of like one of the ways that you can find the right type of fit for whatever you're trying to fund, but how in general do you pick the right opportunity for you and your project? There's so many different opportunities out there. Yeah, you know, I'll jump in on this one. I do think, of course, when it comes to um, existing grant programs that offered on an annual basis or on an anticipated cycle to always see what projects are funded. Mm -hmm. Also, if you um, have a relationship with the artists who received the funding, like having them look at your application, I would 100% always say you should always have a someone that is not your biggest fan, read your application. I mean, they can be your biggest fan, but have someone else who's maybe a little less of a fan read the application to give you critical feedback um, just for a, a different set of eyes, which of course is the recommendation of to start your process of apply, applying early. Um, but yeah, see if you can see yourself being funded by the mission and objectives of, that, the, that the grant program 
you know, stipulates and, you know, ask people's advice on it. Um, I, I just, again, want to remind all of the artists that this is not always your burden solely and to reach out to a very actually close and connected community of very, um, you know, uh, supportive artists uh, and peers uh, who, who will help you go through this process objectively. Yeah, I think that's really great advice. It's always so helpful to have another set of eyes on whatever you're doing, because I think it helps you to hone perhaps that vision a little more tightly. And then as, as we know, the four of us, grants often have very tight restrictions on how many words or characters you can have per, per question. And sometimes it can be really tricky to get your work down to that, but another person's eyes on what you've written can be super helpful to make those really necessary cuts. Crystal, what's your perspective in finding the right opportunity? I know you work with a number of different organizations too. Yes, I think that it's sometimes you just, you want to make it fit because you think, oh, that there's such a good foundation and oh, it's such a big grant. It's there, it's so much money. I, I really want to apply for that. But like Louise said, look to see, are they funding similar projects? They're probably not going to go way out on a limb. Their foundations tend to be a little more conservative. Um, and if they're not, it's that's probably you don't want to waste your time. Um, I I had that experience recently where I really thought a group I was working with would fit a criteria for a certain foundation, but when I read their annual report, I saw that they really weren't funding any arts related things. And as much as I wanted to show that this organization was arts and social justice, you know that they really did do the work that matched this foundation, I, I could just see that they, they were not going to be a good fit. Um, and, and then I actually reached out to the program manager and she confirmed it. So it was, it was better. We just didn't, you know, sometimes you can't make it fit. So really do your homework. Um, and uh, I think if there's another artist who you admire or work that you like, then it's, you know, just, yeah, do that networking and ask questions and find out. You can always um, snoop around people's websites and check out who their sponsors are and, and, uh, and then approach foundations like that. I think that what you just said about like doing your research right and reaching out to different people in your network can be really helpful, but also to the funder themselves. Um, there are often opportunities that the funder will present like a webinar where yeah. they'll talk about the, the requirements of the application and kind of walk you through it. So I suggest keeping that on your radar and putting those types of things on your calendar if you're interested in an opportunity and not sure if it's a good fit. But then Brendan, from your perspective, working with directly with a funder, what are your thoughts on reaching out directly to someone there to ask questions and get clarification? Um, yeah, I, I mean, to your point, I mean, it's funny because yesterday I actually had a lunch and learn where I, it was an hour, you know, from noon to one, um, you could register through Eventbrite. And I basically spent about 45 minutes talking about the public art process, the nuts and bolts, how, how the budgets are allocated, how we put panels together, what the approval process is for the art selection. Um, and then I went through, we have two open calls right now on our website, one for the Sun Valley neighborhood and one for a new 911 call center in Montbello. So I kind of went through the themes and the site and the budget for each of those and answered questions. So definitely most administrators, arts administrators, public art administrators are more than happy to answer an email um, or have a quick chat on the phone to talk about the process, talk about the calls, um, what's needed, how to make your application better. Um, I'm probably not going to read your letter of intent and give you feedback on an actual call that, you know, that kind of starts to cross a line. Um, but I agree, if, if you're interested in public art, then definitely reach out to some friends or acquaintances that have done public art before and, 
and you know grill them um, about the process. Again, it's not for every artist, but it, it can be a really fulfilling um, way to get your art out into the public realm. And I think even if it's a, even if it's an application that you've done before, and you might think, oh, I I already know this one. I I still watch the webinar. I still watch the tutorial every year because little pieces change. You need to refresh your memory. Um, you just you have to answer the questions very specifically and very. Um, grant writing is not creative writing. As much as you want to be interesting and 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 let your passion come through, you have to be clear and concise, like with the word counts and and getting your message across. So the more you can uh, gather from those lunch and learns or webinars, it will definitely help you. Yeah, I'll I'll echo that too. I mean, we I mean, as the panel goes through applications. Um, it can sometimes be really obvious if an artist is just kind of copying and pasting their same like letter of intent to every call. The panel really wants to know that this site is is specifically interesting to you and why. And so, you know, and our our word counts are pretty, they are pretty small. So you kind of do have to be concise. And that's because these panelists are reading hundreds of applications. And so mm -hmm. we kind of want to get your your, you know your nugget of, of what makes you special and what and why this site is the right project for you. Um, but again, we our program specifically in Denver, we really want to help emerging artists make that leap from whether it's gallery work or temporary work to more permanent municipal public art. So we are we are um, that's one of our goals. And I will just say it is their job too. That's the program manager's job to answer your questions, to clarify things. So you shouldn't at all hesitate about asking questions. What I would say you don't want to do is call and ask for exceptions to the rules, because that is just annoying to them. Um, and they, you know, they have those rules and deadlines. They don't want to grant extensions, and it doesn't matter why. You just so just. Be prepared to follow all the, the rules and, and regulations, but if you have questions, feel free to reach out. You know, something that you said, Brendan, about like that, what is the nugget, right? That makes you the best fit for this opportunity. And I, I'm kind of thinking from a, from a singer's perspective and answering that question too, because the reality is that not all grants or open call opportunities are for just visual art or just public art. There are a lot of opportunities for musicians and singers as well. And a lot of those are focused on education and continuing your education. And the same goes for artist opportunities as well. So it's really making sure you pick that nugget out of why this educational program that you want to attend or that is available to you that you can't afford and you need money for it. Why is it so important for you to attend? What is the impact that it will have on your life and the life of your community? And how is it important for the funder to understand that? And because I think that will make you a more compelling case, right? Absolutely. That, that was really well said, Leah. I, I, I've I'm currently the grants manager for the city of Lafayette. They received CARES funding. And we just went through um, reading applications from artists in Lafayette. And that came up with the panelists. Um, you know, is this artist project, is it going to impact anyone beyond this artist? I, as much as we wanna support individuals, if, we're, if we can support you and then you are gonna turn around and benefit the community, that's, that's what the funder wants to do. Um, so yeah, finding those collaborations, working with schools or students or community members um, is, you know, that's, that's what the, that's otherwise, um, if there's no public good, in it, it's not gonna be a very compelling ask. It's very true with any funder, I think. <laughs> yeah, one thing I would also say is that, you know, funders through their website and through opportunities, they give you a vocabulary to speak to them through. 
in some ways. So if you can look at their values and what is core to how their programs operate, speak in that language. Um, and, and then of course, when you're thinking about, especially if it's you know a request for qualifications versus like a request for proposals, uh, how you can not only tie your image samples with your artist statement and their speaking cohesively together, in that shared language to the funder, you know. So how you know it's it's uh, oftentimes on the backside of funding and grant programs. You know, panelists again are are looking through three hundred to four hundred applications. They're doing it quickly. So as much as the the components of your application can speak to each other, be connected and also be connected to the language of the opportunity. I think that is a good kind of review to do of your application. Um, so many times, you know, I uh, I feel like I have uh, been in discussions uh, in in grant review process where the artist statement and the work samples provided were completely disconnected. Um, you know, it like as a dumb example, I'm going to say like the artist statement was focused on butterflies and only unicorns were shown in their image samples and there was no connection between the two of them. Um, I sat on a public art panel one time where the person did not really show any mock-ups or maquettes of anything but instead showed 500 slides of waterfalls as their inspiration. And so you just you you want to do this exercise with someone else to see how your your uh, idea is landing and 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 again how it relates to the language that the call is setting up for you. Definitely, it's almost. Like a, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm just going to say piggybacking on that that your artist statement doesn't have to be static. You know, if you can have more than one. You know, if you're a sculptor and a muralist, you know, have one for each type of call and, and be specific with, with what you what you talk about. And, and, and if you haven't updated your artist statement in a few years, take a look at it. Maybe it needs reevaluating. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, like, would you, and Courtney Newman just asked the, the same question that I was about to ask you is, how do you craft a good artist statement or what what is one in general I think singers aren't necessarily as used to that because we're so often performing work of other people right but artists are you're creating your own vision so what is an artist statement and what does a good one look like yeah can I just apologize on behalf of the art world that I did not author that this thing exists because I know that this just it has like created tyranny on the souls of so many artists that it, and that it's much more simple to like, or at least it's much more understood to say, uh, you know, artist biography or a CV or something to, but the artist statement is this thing that I feel like the goalpost is constantly moving. So I would a hundred percent agree with Crystal that like, know that this is not a static thing, that it evolves based on the opportunity. It evolves based on who you are and your practice and its relevance to the, the climate and the culture and the context of the day. And so when it comes to tips to writing great artist statements, I would 100% begin with the work that you're providing as your work samples and then interpret that work in a way that speaks more broadly, of course, to your practice, but also relates back to it. And so, yeah, have multiple vers versions of it. Um, be succinct and clear. I wouldn't dive into your life's philosophy at length. I've seen that done a lot. And, you know, it's not that those philosophies are not interesting, but you lose, I, I fear you lose as someone who facilitates panels, um, people's attention. Because again, you're always working with panelists who have different stakeholders and they are the advocate for different communities. You know, speaking again to like Brendan's public art um, field, you know, you're when you're an artist presenting in front of a public art panel, one of those guys is only in charge of maintenance and does not care about any philosophy. He or she just wants to know that they do not have to put your piece back together every day anytime the sun's light changes on the angle 
you know, of the pe et cetera. So you got to know who you're talking to. And especially in a public art context, you got to think about those type of things. And so, again, as much as you can be clear and speak to how the work, um, again, perfectly represents what you're saying, and, you know, at the same time, pulls in your values and your practice and approach, but in a succinct way, um, that is probably like the best um, I can advise in terms of just being, again, kind of an administrator to these processes and hearing um, feedback and the approaches sometimes. And this is just my own personal bias. You can take it or leave it. I, I like it when an artist statement is written in first person. I, I, I find it a little strange when I read one that's written in third person. It just makes me feel like they're I don't know that they had a gallery assistant or I don't know, I don't know who, who wrote this if you didn't write this and isn't it about you? So it, that, to me, that sounds a little strange. Um, and I feel like I connect with the um, author a lot better if it's in first person. And uh, yeah, and I mean, for public art, it's we don't really ask for just an artist statement or your art philosophy. It's really how do you connect your work to this specific site. So what that really entails is reading the request for qualifications. We, we will never post a request for proposals. It's always an RFQ. We just kind of want to get to know you and get to know why you're interested. So really read that RFQ. And like, like Louise mentioned, take some of those words, take some of those phrases, take, you know, what are some of the themes that have been listed and how can you relate those themes to your work um, is really important. Um, another little tip I would say, if you are interested in applying for public art, at least for the city of Denver, again, we are requesting your qualification. So that's your resume or your CV, a short letter of intent, and then images of your past work. Um, in your letter of intent, I would suggest don't write a proposal in that paragraph. Don't say, I'm going to create a glass sculpture made out of these materials for the site. We, we just really want to know who you are as an artist and why you're interested. And then if you are selected, we will actually pay you to create that proposal for us. Um, when you kind of give us your idea right up front, the panel sometimes is like, oh, they missed it. They didn't quite understand. You know, there's, there's meetings that happen when you're selected as a finalist that help you create a, a really good proposal. So just a little tip for public art. Yeah, I think with the integrating elements of their values as, as the funder or parts of the request for qualifications or proposals into your different elements throughout your entire application is such a vital aspect. Even for me, just thinking of it like you're building a cover letter and a resume for a job application, right? You want to use exact words from that job description that they've advertised within those two pieces that you're providing to them to connect yourself, your work, your experience directly to what they're looking for. And from the singer's perspective too, with your images or and how they connect with the rest of your application, um, and we'll get into this, I think, with, with art as well. That's my next question is, you want your video performance attachments as, as a musician or your image attachments to go along with the rest of your application. As Louise said, you don't want to send them, tell them you're doing butterflies and send them only unicorns. So my question to all of you is, I really liked that example, actually. <laughs> I thought it was fun. Um, I'll do better with my examples in the future, but you know, here's for being on the fly. <laughs> yeah. But my question to you three is what, what makes a good or like, how do you select those images? And if you don't really have any, how do you kind of start going about that process of collecting work samples and finding the right fit? Yeah, this well, is something. Oh, go ahead, Crystal. Sorry. I was just going to say this is a quick thing. Um, if they ask for four or five samples, put the very best one first, because these people are reading a lot. I don't know that they, I mean, hopefully they're going to click on them all, but make that best impression, put the most important, the most visually arresting first. 
Yeah, try to have um, your images have uh, not busy backgrounds, you know, whether it's a white wall or, you know, good lighting. Um, if you can, of course, get them documented, that's always great. But if you can't, that's okay. Just even a clean wall um, that doesn't have any visual distraction is super important and the lighting is good. Like I, I've seen a lot of images where it's like still on the easel or like there is, you know, and that just, I, I feel like you want to present it as professional documentation, not necessarily in process documentation. Yeah, these are all, I'll just echo what's already been said, because again, we have panelists who are looking through lots of applications. And so really putting your, your best images that really relate back to the call as your first and second are really important. And, and again, keeping those images so that we know what we're looking at right away. You know, if we have to struggle to say, wait, where is the art or what is the art that I'm looking at? You know, the panelist is gonna keep moving. And so um, best images first, if you have to hire somebody to help you document your work, that might be helpful, you know? Um, in call for entry, you're, you can always put a little description in with each image and, and that is really important too, as panelists look through and they, want, they actually do wanna know more. If you have that information there that's easily clickable, that will help you. And photograph your work before you frame it so that you don't have it behind glass or the frame may detract. Uh, so that's that's just a good rule of practice too, you know, as you go. You know, when you especially if you're a printmaker, you know, as soon as you're finished, scan or photograph it and and keep a um, Keep a, an archive of all your images. You know, I think of this from the singer's perspective again, and I think we're kind of taught some of these things of like, the only way that you can get a job is by sending people a, a video of yourself. But the time of COVID has changed a little bit. People are looking for funders and companies are looking for more interactive performance videos, things where you're using the environment around you and not just standing in front of a piano or something like that. So I encourage um, any musicians and singers that are on this call to really explore that option as well. And making sure, of course, that the music selections that you're offering, that they reflect back to whatever the opportunity is, which is key. We got a question from Courtney. What about for emerging artists who are still building a public art portfolio? I've done a few public art projects and most of my paintings are on large scale canvases. What suggestions might you have for someone like that? Um, again, I mean, re read the call carefully because you know we do sometimes say we're looking for sculptural works and a variety of materials, but we're not looking for two dimensional work. And then we get, we inevitably get a couple applications that are watercolor paintings. And so, you know, right off the bat, we're like this, we, we, this artist didn't really read the call. So my, my suggestion is to, I mean, I, and you mentioned it, that you, that you do have some public art projects, always try to, you know, document those, whether they're temporary or permanent um, so that we, we get an idea of your vision and how you implemented that vision in a public space. Um, I hope I'm answering your question. And, and if I'm not, I, I can come back to it. <laughs> um, but that, that's kind of my, my quick answer to that question. Is to yeah, continue to build that portfolio of public art, um, unless yeah. it's a call for two dimensional work. And in that case, you can use your paintings. And I would say too, in that scenario, I think a lot of us are working towards building a, a portfolio in a different kind of art than we've been doing for a long time. Um, and we don't necessarily have work samples that would align with that funding opportunity that you're really excited for. So my suggestion is look for those opportunities in your community, look for collaborators in your community that you could work on projects together with to get some of that experience. And then you can start, I think, building up your own portfolio of those different types of work. And two really great resources in Denver for helping you um, uh, archive your, your images are Nine Dot Arts uh, and an Artwork Archive. Um, you should definitely 
add yourself to the nine dot arts catalog. It's free, um, you know, fill that out. You never know um, if what they're looking for, they, they, what they do, if you're not familiar with them, they um, have corporate clients who are looking to commission artists for, you know, new spaces or renovating um, buildings or office space. And so they go to their, uh, their, their roster of artists and they look for images and, and, and descriptions that might fit what that client's looking for. So absolutely every artist in the, and it's, it, they, they are international, but we're lucky that they're based here in Denver. Um, so every artist should be, should be in their catalog. And then I think artwork archive, I don't know exactly how the pay structure works with them, but I think there might be a free or low cost option for uh, using their services. Um, and it's, so just, it's a really, they, they're all set up, um, you know, so you have the title, the date and um, images. And so whenever you need that information, you're not scrambling, trying to find it, you know, you've just got it in one place. You know, just because they've come up a couple of times, I do want to point everybody that they just posted a new grant mm -hmm. uh, called the uh, Art Business Accelerator Grant. It's a up to 10,000 or no, it's $2,500 for 10 artists. Now it is a national call, actually an international call too. So there's, there are a lot of applications already in, but even if you apply, you get access to the, the business curriculum that they are providing. Um, and so I would just recommend uh, looking at it because um, their co-founder definitely comes from kind of really a business best practices space as kind of a startup person. And so he um, is building a curriculum for artists to utilize when they're thinking of building their own businesses, either as an individual, a collective, or ultimately as a nonprofit. So I know that due date is like in May. Um, Redline is a fiscal sponsor for that grant. So you can find it on our website, but also go to Artwork Archive's website, and then that'll direct you to a submittable page. Great. We've got another question around um, images and attaching those to your application. And the question is from Christina, and it is essentially that her images are all of her own paintings, but her desire is to bridge her painting world with school communities, and they don't have student or community images that are current. Is it okay to just show your current work as a visual artist, even though the intent is to work with kids to create a community art experience? Or what are the suggestions there to paint that picture? Mm -hmm. I think from my, sorry, Louise, you can go. No, 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 go, go, go. From my perspective, I look at this as another opportunity for collaboration, right? And of, of building relationships and starting those conversations with schools and, and with the community kind of groups that you want to work with. Or, um, oh my gosh, like Bird Seed Collective, right? They do work with other community projects throughout the whole city, um, mural projects. So I, I, I'm a big person on collaboration. So that's always my first step. In, in processes like this. Yeah, I would also just say volunteerism in, in the sense of, you know, 99% yes, of the no, time I, I don't know. tell anyone to volunteer and you will, I, I need, artists need more pay in this world. However, I do feel like if you are venturing into uncharted territory or territory and you're trying to build a portfolio of work, you know, um, Nonprofits like Platform, like Redline, like Think360 Arts are always looking for teaching artists, mentoring artists. Oftentimes those opportunities are actually paid, but you know, always looking for artists to help um, you know, facilitate classroom engagement. So you don't have to go at this alone. If you're interested in working with students and you're interested in you know, kind of building this portfolio of work that's more collaborative. Many arts nonprofits have educational programming where they're always sending out calls to engage 
artists who are interested in learning this, you know, kind of um, learning this new muscle. And, you know, you, Redline through our art core mentoring program and Epic Arts program, we would never send artists into a classroom by themselves or it's always with mentorship alongside the artists as, as you go at it, but it's a good way to not only get, you know, a stipend for your time, but also build a portfolio of work with a, a classroom with the K through 12 community. That's great. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Think 360 Arts. That's a good one. I, I feel like their roster has been closed for a while, maybe because of the pandemic, but eventually it'll, it has to open up again. Um, also the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, BMOCA, they have a, a really robust camp program. And I, I feel like I always see listings for, um, they, they were looking for artists to help with their camp and, and, and educational programs. Um, the Boulder, City of Boulder also has an arts and education grant that's actually open right now, um, due in April for $3,000 if you have a school in Boulder um, that you want to work with and you have a project idea, that one's open right now. Um, but I totally agree, like most organizations have uh, a little education department and just just showing up and saying you're willing to, to get involved, I think would be a lot of places you'd be surprised they would be very receptive. I know Music One's open right now. Our Playground Ensemble is looking for teaching artists. Um, and then uh, Friends of Chamber Music also looks for teaching artists fairly often as well. Uh, and Think360 is actually a member here at Converge Denver and their office is next door and I know they're here so I can follow up with them after this and let you all know what the outcome of that is. Cool. Oh, I had another question in my mind. So we had um, one question from Madeline, which is kind of segueing away from the images and building kind of your own portfolio of work. But the question is, how would you advise a group of artists working to build an arts organization that is not yet a nonprofit? It's bigger than an individual artist or even a collective and they're searching for grants, but they're definitely smaller than a traditional arts organization at this point in time. I always ask people to consider whether forming a nonprofit is the right option. We have so many different nonprofits out there that I think that um, condensing operations with another organization that already does something similar or bringing a project to them as a proposal of something that they could integrate in what they do is always a good idea. But there's also the route of fiscal sponsorship. Um, and I know that Louise has some really great information on that because I believe Redline serves as a fiscal sponsor. Yeah, so, you know, it certainly would be kind of the, whether you are um, going down the road to be a nonprofit or just, you know, um, a larger collective looking to get larger funding and you need a fiscal sponsorship partner, it's another great reason for you to kind of develop relationships, whether as a teaching artist or, a, you know, a member with nonprofits, because many arts nonprofits do have fiscal sponsorship opportunities. But of course, they're more uh, excited to work with artists that they have a familiarity with them and they, they uh, you know, have a relationship, you know, it's always very hard to um, just ask for this type of partnership when you haven't had a relationship with the organization previously. So I'd always recommend, again, building that relationship first, but fiscal sponsorship is something that is, um, you know, you can, uh, you can approach it from a lot of different levels where the nonprofit can just take a very small administrative fee and really just be uh, the recipient of the fund that you receive uh, through the, um, you know, the foundation that is, that it's uh, providing the grant that you applied for, and then they distribute it in one check out to you. And that's like the easiest form of fiscal sponsorship for a nonprofit. Or you can truly uh, pitch it in some ways as a programmatic opportunity with that nonprofit where you actually, in some ways are more um, 
you're more integrating into the mission of the nonprofit and, and in some ways expanding their mission because this project that you provide does that and you can speak to the nonprofit in that way that you want to do this with. You know, that that again sometimes takes a little more time, but just to give you as an example, Slam Nuba is a program that Redline has a fiscal sponsorship relationship here. Now we have done um, spoken word poetry at Redline for the last eight years, and um, it it already was something that we wanted to do, and we helped to build a capacity around the program. And so now it's a more integrated program offering um, that Redline hosts because it 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 makes sense for us to host this for a lot of reasons, and we've already been doing it prior to becoming the fiscal sponsor for Slam Nuba and what's so great is now Slam Nuba gets to um, apply for more opportunities because uh, it is a nonprofit applying for those opportunities versus an individual. Um, so, you know, I feel like there could be another session completely on fiscal sponsorship, <laughs> but that is one way to answer your question, Madeline, about, you know, if you were kind of going towards the road of being a nonprofit, um, how how to think about kind of that next step. And then if you continue, if you build a strong fiscal sponsorship relationship, you build those resources and then can eventually graduate into your own after the amount of years to, you know, either reach the public support test, which is kind of an IRS test on whether you have distributed at, or demonstrated as a nonprofit a public need or can show that your funds um, are diversified and you can you are truly publicly supported. Yeah, um, I did have someone mention who is a, an accountant that you know the IRS generally doesn't like fiscal sponsorships to last for an extended amount of time. So it's not a permanent solution, but like you just ended with Louise, it's really that bridge to get you to the next step of, of your evolution as an organization. And I also wanted to toss in there, I don't know if you did, but uh, Fractured Atlas as the website that offers fiscal sponsorship to individual artists or small organizations, collectives, that type of thing. They offer a lot of different resources and uh, fiscal sponsorship is one of them, which can be really great in a crowdfunding way as well, because you can encourage people to donate to you through Fractured Atlas and they'll get a tax deductible or their tax deduction from their contribution. Whereas if they're just giving you the money, then they don't get to write that off on their taxes. So it's an interesting thing. Yes, and Fractured Atlas is great. Locally, we also have Boulder County Arts Alliance. If you're living or working in Boulder County, they also serve as a fiscal sponsor. And, and they actually do have some groups um, that have been fiscally sponsored for 10 plus years. Uh, for some organizations, that works just fine. It, it really is um, legal, um, legal, legal fund laundering. <laughs> um, you know, it's perfectly, it seems kind of crazy, but yeah, all you, you get a fiscal sponsor and someone can donate to them. They, they keep usually five to 7% of that funds and then the rest is regranted to you. Um, and hopefully they provide those mentorship uh, services also that Louise mentioned um, to help your organization grow and, and, and find, um, because even nonprofits are still businesses. You know, you have, to, you have to have a purpose. You have to have diversified streams of, of revenue. Um, it, it can't be all only about getting grants. Very valid point. So I wonder then what we've kind of we've covered the artist statements, we've covered imagery, um, we've talked about this fiscal sponsorship aspect, which also plays very much into preparing a grant application and finding what opportunities are actually suitable for what you want to do. But what other tips and tricks might you have for an artist, a musician, an individual, a collective, preparing a grant application? What makes a successful proposal from the writing perspective and putting together the actual application? Do 
Well, I kind of feel like our conversation <laughs> covered a lot of those territories, but I mean, I guess if there is a, I mean, what do you think, Leah, that we haven't covered that would, that based on what you have, like what, what aspect, I mean, budgeting is an aspect I can think of that we haven't talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly if it's a letter of intent versus a full proposal, those are different, those are different presentations of a budget. Um, you know, when you're, when you're doing a letter uh, of intent, you know, it's a more of a high level breakdown, but make sure that your budget isn't just one line that says artist fee, because it's not even accurate, because oftentimes you guys underpay yourself anyway in your proposals, unfortunately, but like, you know, saying insulation materials, like if you have, um, you know, uh, rental things for like, if you're a muralist, like a lift, um, you know, the insurance you need to provide the, you know, a percentage of your mortgage, because it's the office that you uh, work in like there. So of course, like, with a letter of intent, it doesn't have to be that detailed um, when it comes to your costs. But in the full proposal, just remember everything that makes this possible, including transit, including like um, fabrication, including all these other things. Um, and again, do your homework on that side when it comes to what's realistic uh, with, I know Brendan can speak more specifically to this, but typically, you know, the artist percentage of like public art proposals, you know, ranges between like 15 to 25%, but Brendan can speak more accurately on that. Um, it really depends upon kind of how you involve yourself and then who you also need as part of your workforce to get these things done. And can you create a team of people to help you do it? And how is that reflected in the budget? So similar to the artist statement, the budget needs to speak to the narrative of the application. Um, and make sure that they in some ways tie together as far as uh, what you plan to do to show that you truly understand the scope of what you're presenting in financial terms. And, um, you know, I, again, this is another, I feel like it's another workshop, uh, because again, it's like, nobody like, you know, comes into this universe understanding the language of budgets based on a million different opportunities that have a million different uh, panels that have a million different expectations. You know, it's unrealistic, but there are some best practices that you can kind of build from. And most of the time, uh, grant applications will have a budget template or will provide a budget template for artists to at least begin the process with. Yeah, definitely. I know as you were talking about- I think about we have- Two. I think we have a template that to throw out that we're going to include to everybody too right yes we are going to send that to, uh, to everyone i think too from that perspective it, it it goes into making sure that you're reading the requirements of the foundation and the requirements of that application a lot you really need to make sure that you understand what they want to see and what they're asking you for because they might say they're willing to pay certain pieces of your project but not other aspects like they might not be willing to pay for your transportation but they are willing to pay for your supplies so that goes into the budgeting aspect but then it also really goes into how you're responding to the questions that they ask you um, if they're asking you how you plan to engage the community in this project and engaging diverse communities or underserved populations is part of their major funding aspect then you need to be talking about that in, in how you're reaching the community in that response to that question. Cool. We have um, no other questions, I don't think. Jenna asked, are there grants out there helping to support singers as they're trying to fund lessons, coachings, and workshops. Yes, there are indeed. Um, I think that's one of the biggest opportunities for professional musicians is for continuing education. And I have some of those resources that I'll include on the list of resources that we send out to people at the end. Take note Colorado, yeah, that is one. That one is specific around like education in rural areas, I believe, and students who haven't, um, don't usually have access 
to instruments and to high quality arts education. We've got another about how to find fiscal sponsors in other parts of the country. I think that's a little tricky. I mean, I do think yeah. Fractured Atlas is a New York based. Uh, so the what Crystal had already mentioned, um, that is, um, you know, kind of an umbrella organization that will help with fiscal sponsorship. Um, but then, of course, like if you are working within a specific, you know, region, and there's a reason for that work, and that you have a, a organization, or you vote, you know, you know, again, I feel like, especially within the arts, relationships, relationships, relationships mean more than anything. They mean more than degrees. They mean more than experience. They mean more than, you know, if you can nurture and foster relationships with all the different. Um, you know, uh, stakeholders and and folks that kind of make the arts economy roll. That will that will really kind of give you a boost when it comes to arriving at a project that you want to do. So you know, I would I would just never pass up kind of that that focus of kind of building these relationships. But Fractured Atlas it is you don't you know that is their service, and I I do think it's based out of New York. Yes. Yep. Yeah, and, and but they are not totally national in their scope. You can be from anywhere and be um, fiscally sponsored by them. Yeah, National Performance Network that Mary Grace uh, mentioned, I sit on their board that it, they absolutely do um, fiscal sponsorship as well um, through specifically an equity lens. Um, and so I, uh, for those of you who are performing artists or stage based artists, um, they are a amazing organization to look into. I'm a little biased because Redline is an NPN partner and I'm a board member, but I very much love that organization. It's a, a great thing to drop in there. Yeah, it does. I think the relationships part, I mean, when you think of grant writing, you don't necessarily think of needing to engage people outside of your own brain, right? You just think about, oh, this is, seems so daunting. Look at all these questions that they ask, all these things that I have to attach. But the relationships are such a key part of making sure that you have the support that you need to in fiscal sponsorship, if that's necessary, or collaborators within the project, or if you need a, a certain element to be provided, like sometimes I do things and I don't own a whole audio equipment set up, you know, but I have friends who are able to lend me that or provide it for a low cost, right? And then also having those really necessary critical eyes on your application once you finish it. Relations you know oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just finishing my thought. You know, one professional development service I would just do a plug for also that, you know, in some ways the era of COVID has kind of opened us to these national relationships because, you know, Zoom allows us to do that. So there is a, first of all, there's one that Redline is in, which is uh, Advancing Creatives. And for those of you who are mobilizing for the nightmare that is our collective tax reality. Um, we're doing a program on the 23rd that's free um, at five o'clock where we're going to have a CPA answering questions around, um, you know, for those of you who have to uh, file a Schedule C as working artists. So that's one plug, but that is co-presented with an organization called Workshop, which is VV R-K-S-H-O-P dot art. That's a New York based organization that does uh, coaching for artists as well as professional develop series like website tune-ups and artist statements and literally Patty who is the founder Patty Johnson who was an art critic in New York well still is for Art F City um, she realized that this is kind of the work she wants to do in addition to kind of doing critical writing and contemporary arts practice, but to be more in the advocacy space for artists. So I would definitely recommend, you know, she's doing a website tune up for artists, which is tomorrow. 
Um, and but it's an ongoing series, and she's pulled some pretty uh, heavy hitters in the art world to be the teaching instructors for this. Uh, so I would look into that because she she helps write grants too. I mean, of course, it's fee based, so it's it's not always feasible. But I would certainly look into it if uh, you're wanting to kind of put certain resources um, towards uh, your professional practice. are sharing that kind of stuff online, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, what about, so the, I think the last kind of thought that I had was really around making sure that you all feel confident and comfortable moving forward and doing this yourselves, right? That I hope that the questions that we've been asking each other and that you've been asking us have helped you to feel a little bit more confident in that. Um, Louise, uh, Brendan, and Crystal, I really appreciate all of your insight and your support. Um, everyone just feel like, you know, schedule the time in your day, set out that block to really sit down with the application, look at everything, take some notes, go back and write it. Take the time that you need to really feel confident and comfortable with your writing and you'll be able to do it. And even if your first one or your second one or whatever, if, if they get denied, just know that you feel confident in what you have written and that it reflects you and the project that you are looking to do. And that even without that specific funder support, that your project and that you and your work are of value and important to our community. So with that, um, I just wanna let you all know that we're sending the budget template out. We're gonna send those URLs to calls for entry, lists of resources for loads of opportunities. Um, if there is a public realm or a public realm, actually, we're going to be sending out in that email as well a survey and asking you to respond with the most helpful aspect of today, as well as if you feel like there's any follow up or a specific realm of grant writing. As Luis mentioned, there's a couple of opportunities within grant writing that we can really easily dig into as a whole session in and of itself. So if that's of interest to you, we're super open to that. This series is a monthly workshop series and we're working on planning the second half of 2021. So we've got plenty of open availability and want to create and offer whatever services are most interesting to you. Uh, our next workshop is April 21st and that is with Michael Gadlin, a local visual artist, uh, an amazing human on how to price your artwork. So that'll be pretty um, helpful for visual artists in particular. And then May is actually a really fun opportunity. I've got the grants um, up here. It's music and creative exploration with Victoria, who is a licensed creative arts therapist and board certified music therapist. So we're all going to be participating in creative activity with the own supplies that you have at your own disposal. Um, and really kind of digging into our own mental health and wellness and exploring things from there. If there are any other questions, y'all can email them to us, respond to our, our email after today. But otherwise, thank you to our wonderful panelists and to all of our partners and to all of you for attending. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>